From Next47, this is the AI Unveil podcast with me, Gaurav Kotak. In this episode, I'm speaking with Bram Degater, VP of Product, and Yeroon Minart, Chief Software Architect from Showpad, a sales enablement platform with over 1,000 customers. Yeroon and Bram are Showpad veterans and are leading the charge of AI innovations at the company. This makes them the perfect people to speak about the next five years of sales enablement and the impact AI will have. We start this episode by talking about the big picture, both the opportunities of and the potential disruptions from AI to their business. We then zoom into multiple capabilities they've already launched, from AI-powered search to AI-powered document summarization and test creation. They've taken a thoughtful and deliberate approach, spending over a year on the data pipelines and hygiene, investing in ML ops to increase AI productivity across the org, and using multiple LLMs and tuning parameters based on the use case. I learned a lot in this episode from Yurun and Bram. Let's jump right in. Welcome to AI Unveiled. Today, we're joined by Bram Degater, VP of Product, and Jerome Minat, Chief Software Architect from Showpad, a leading sales enablement platform. Bram, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thanks uh, so much for uh, for having me. This is uh, yeah, really exciting to uh, be with this group on this call. So looking forward to it. Yes, absolutely. And Jaron, uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah, anytime. Really looking forward to this conversation with you and with Bram. So to kick things off, Bram, for the few people that may not know what Showpad does, could you give us a brief summary? Sure. Um, so Showpad actually makes uh, sales enablement uh, software. So that's used by sort of the largest uh, sales teams in the world. Um, we currently, so marketing-wise, we call it the enablement operating system, um, which kind of spells out that it's an all-in-one solution mm-hmm. where typically marketing and revenue teams, they typically come together to empower particularly sellers with typically three things, content, Uh, and training to engage ultimately buyers. And the main mission of that is to add sort of meaningful uh, meaningful value during every sort of sales interaction. So we're typically used by some of the largest uh, enterprises with a complex, typically complex product or sort of complex markets that they sell into. So Mm -hmm. think of sort of Dow, uh, think of Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson are some of those uh, key customers that we have. Um, two goals, make sellers more effective. And on the other hand, make your sales and marketing uh, more efficient. So kind of cost reduction. I'm sure we'll dive, dive in. And it's in, at all times, seller effectiveness is important, probably even more so in this economy. So Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah. And Bram, um, tell us a little bit about your role at Showpad. So I'm my current role is uh, VP product. So in that role, I'm responsible for... Uh, overall strategy, also uh, overall roadmap, of course. So I lead uh, our product management team that's now about uh, 15 people strong, uh, interacting a lot with uh, Irun on that as well. So I'll uh, maybe hand it over to uh, Irun as well. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Irun. I'm Chief Architect and Head of Data at Showpad. And um, in my role, one of the things I look after is bringing in AI as a capability into Showpad and generally making sure that we can translate that into innovation towards customers. And as a head of data, I look at AI, I look at analytics, I look at data engineering. I've been at the company for about 11 years, so I know know how it started. I know where where the legacy is and where the the nice parts and the fun parts are of of our (laughs) software. So, and I'll get to take all those uh, those insights and bring them together into innovation for customers, which I'm really excited about. Awesome. Wow. 11 years. That's a, that's a long time. Uh, so you have definitely a history and, and, and probably have opinions of, of the trajectory in the future. So let's maybe just start with the big picture. Um, what do you think sales enablement will look like, say, in five years from now? Mm-hmm. That's a pretty good question. Um, it's definitely a question I think about a lot uh, these days. It's also interestingly for me also a question that probably had you interviewed me, let's say a year ago, the answer would be fundamentally different. So for me, that fundamentally changed with with actually two things. One is sort of external circumstances, and the other is is uh, well, technology is sort of just a leapfrog in, in technology. 
So the one is for me, COVID. COVID definitely had a change on how definitely our type of customer, which is typically a customer that was focused on field sales, had to relook at what do we do in terms of sales strategy. So we've seen a big shift towards what we call now hybrid selling. So a motion where you combine both field sales and inside sales. So that's already having quite a big impact on, on what I think that field will look like and what type of problems we're solving. So in hybrid sales, those two things will have to be connected a lot more. So it'll, ha it'll have to be seamless in terms of doing inside selling and, uh, and, and field selling. So that's quite interesting. The other part for me is what sort of generative AI is is enabling in terms of um, in in terms of the space. So a lot of it. So I probably didn't mention that in the beginning, but a big part, typically at the heart of any sales enablement software, you have essentially a content management uh, tool. So you're trying to bring all of that sales collateral into your product, but it's typically made outside of the product itself. So it's made by marketing teams outside of that. They make campaigns for new launches, et cetera. So what we are seeing is that there will definitely be a disruption overall in terms of content creation. So how content is being created. And historically, there was always a pretty large cost to creating content. So uh, you needed experts in terms of typing that out, making those brochures. You needed specialized tooling to lay that out. That feels like it will be completely disrupted. So if I start thinking about what that will do overall with the space, is that sort of you'll get a you'll start seeing a sort of increase in the amount of contents that is generated. Um, you'll also start seeing a sort of cost reduction of, of how quickly marketing content can be uh, can be created. So those two kind of motions become quite interesting because that means you can start creating content right where it's actually needed, which is for that specific case, for that specific customer, much more personalized, much more tailored. Um, at the same time, it also starts kind of focusing the role of marketing a lot more on actually generating the right knowledge rather and the right messaging etc rather than sort of craftsmen of uh, or craftsmen of uh, of of content creation so that in itself already is quite a sort of landslide uh, i see in in the way that you look at the heart of your own product which is quite interesting yeah very interesting so on one hand you mentioned there'll be a lot more content created um and the cost will go down. And the way I interpret that is software can create content. And that's kind of, you know, in Showpad's wheelhouse, right? Um, but on the other hand, you also mentioned content created on the fly. Um, and in that case, it's possible that some of the Showpad capabilities of uh, searching across static content created beforehand is less relevant, right? And in general, right, um, when a tectonic shift in technology uh, happens, some of the existing capabilities are less relevant, right? Um, and, and, and so you are there any parts of your platform or in general, um, this new vision of sales enablement it may have the potential to disrupt some of your existing capabilities. Do you think that's a fair statement? And to the extent it is, um, how do you manage this transition? Yeah. Um, so I think it is a fair statement. Uh, I think you call that out really, uh, really correctly. So I, I think I positioned it internally at some point as sort of, I really think there will be a, a sort of second or third generation almost if I, if I look at the history, but sort of a second generation of sales enablement tools out there. And that's especially worrying from a product as in as a VP product of like, well, we're we're a first gen a sales enablement tool. So what do you do with that? Um, so it is, I think it is a pretty tricky challenge. Uh, it's not one I'm shying away from. So I, I, I find it like vastly interesting. And it's also something that we've actually immediately also discussed with customers. So some of our key accounts who actually presented that question. I think for me, there's two things that are that are key. First of what I think will happen. 
So one of the things that I think will become less and less relevant is actually a lot of the sort of enterprise content management tools. So a lot of the tooling around bringing in the content, tagging uh, that content, preparing it for distribution, putting context around that. I think that will become less and less relevant. And especially for our largest enterprise customers, you're starting to push scale in terms of content management. So a lot of those sort of scaling issues, I think might actually disappear. So that definitely presents a tricky balance because short term, we still need to actually invest in, in scalability of that. Longer term, I actually expect that instead of, because interest, well, for me, very interestingly, it's almost like knowledge within a sales organization, the sort of digital equivalent of that has always been the sales collateral. It's been sort of stored in documents and that's been your sort of, well, digital source of truth almost of that working knowledge that exists within, within a sales or in a marketing organization. It's kind of been that way because that's the way that documents or, or knowledge can be stored. And I think with what, what we see right now with LLMs and, and definitely sort of fine tuning of LLMs uh, or large language models, um, what I think will actually happen is that the core of that system will gradually shift towards a sort of customized, personalized knowledge system. So a large language model that's fine tuned for one specific customer, for one organization and will actually be the carrier of that knowledge, which for me also then presents a change in, in how sales enablement uh, as a function, actually what their role is, which is instead of creating and, and, and sort of curating the documents, so kind of fine tuning that, that knowledge system. So for example, if you introduce a new product that you need to teach that large language model at the heart, about that new product and to stop talking about the other product. So I think the way that we're going about that is um, trying to keep a really close pulse on some of our largest customers, how quickly they're shifting towards that sort of very quick generation of documents, because that will actually determine the pace of how much we still need to invest in sort of old problems, I'm going to call them, versus uh, how quickly we'll shift towards a, a sort of new, newer system of having that knowledge system at the base. That's really interesting. So let us let me just make sure I fully grasp it because it's not something I had thought of until you mentioned it. Customers um, almost have their own language model which reflects their value proposition. Um, but that value proposition, A, has to be fine-tuned once, but also fine-tuned over and over again as the competitive dynamics change, new products are launched. And so the job of sales enablement is actually prompting, if you will, or fine tuning this value proposition language model, let's call it, um, we coined it here, uh, versus creating content from scratch, right? Um, and, and, and then the other thing you mentioned earlier was the craft of pretty content versus just, you know, actual meat, because some of the formatting and aesthetics can be automatically generated far easier, right? Um, that's a really interesting uh, perspective. Um, the other thing I think you didn't mention, but you kind of touched upon it is, you know, when you said Gen 1, or let's call it incumbents of sales enablement, right? Yes. I mean, whose disruption at any point is, is hard and who's better than to disrupt yourself because you have, you know, the customers, you have the customer feedback, you have the workflows, you have the integrations, you have people logging into your product. Um, and then changing some of these behaviors, I can only imagine is a, is a key advantage for a company like Showpad. Absolutely, absolutely. Cool. Well, let's let's kind of zoom in till today and, and near term. Uh, I saw a press release recently uh, where you had launched a lot of new AI capabilities. Uh, what are they? So I think this was back in June that we we uh, launched our press release, uh, launching four AI features. Uh, and this is really our first step at getting AI in our product, but in a responsible way, right? We don't just want to bring AI for the sake of bringing AI, we want to really align it with the use cases that our customers are, are choosing Showpad for. And before I dive into the features, there's actually one key theme that we are, um, that we apply or applied when thinking about which candidates, which features would we be looking for? And it's this notion that um, 
whatever we do, like we focus on use cases that are hard to do right now, but easy to verify. Hard to do, but easy to verify. Hard Makes to sense. do, but easy to verify, which means that for you to manually do those things would take a very long time. I'll give an example in just a second, but it's extremely easy for you to verify that and push that along into the flow and get that distributed to customers. And that's really what Showpad is also about, right? It's like making sure that you can get content, marketing information as quickly as possible in the hands of sales reps so they can be effective. So that really works well with our value proposition, really works well with our product. So one of those features is AI-powered asset summaries, right? So the essence of AI-powered asset summaries is that we, we take a document, a PDF, for example, that has been uploaded, and we generate essentially an FAQ of that document. And the FAQ part is very interesting because it's very tailored towards towards our audience, towards the users we're optimizing for, towards sales reps, right? You know, like if you didn't know about our use case, you would say, what about a summary? Well, summaries are great. That's a lot of, there's a lot of examples about how you can create summaries out of a document. But a sales rep, traditionally, when he's in front of a customer and needs to answer questions from a customer, doesn't have the time to read a paragraph, right? So we've optimized to creating an FAQ which you can very quickly go through. You can just take a look at a at this FAQ. You can see, okay, like what are the, the big questions that typically come out of this document and use the answer to very quickly, you know, like bring that back to, to the customer that that sales rep is sitting in front of. So it just shows you, and I think we'll come back to that later in, in the interview, how important the use case is when applying AI. It's not just about we're applying this technology blindfold. We're really applying based on use case that we have. And then what we did is we actually built on top of this feature. So we have another feature called AI Powered Test Questions, which is basically it generates the FAQ. It generates you the um, it generates you the, the the question and answer pair. But because we have a component in our product that allows you to train and make sure that your sales reps are ready for a conversation, we have a training and coaching component in our product. In that component, we can actually also generate you uh, test questions based on that FAQ technology. So you generate a couple of test questions, um, you generate some right answers, which is that FAQ technology. But then the key part is we also generate wrong answers. So we generate relevant wrong answers for you. And I think that's also super interesting to, to take a look at, to explore, because it's, as you might think, you know, if you run through the exercise in your head, it's not just about generating any answer. It's about generating something that is relevant that could be interpreted as wrong, but obviously uh, is, you know, isn't the right answer to the question. So, and that makes a good training, right? That makes a good test, right? If you can kind of trick the user to pick the right answer, really test them on their knowledge without giving obvious wrong answers. Well, I'm, I'm just going to kind of double click on couple of things that you said before moving on and and I want to ask a few questions because this is really oh, yeah, interesting. Absolutely. So you mentioned you're using the same FAQ in two different use cases, right? Give me an FAQ on the document and the uh, questionnaire if you will or the test, right? Um is the technology or the model exactly the same just on different content or does it need to be fine tuned given the use cases is a little bit different? It, it's similar, right? And Definitely, I think there's opportunity to dive a bit more into our technology stack at some point. Um, but we have the same basic components. So extracting yeah. information from a document, uh, we have you know, like applying, uh, picking the right LLM, designing the prompt. So those com the orchestration component, for example, so those components are relatively the same, but where it gets different is in terms of which component you apply at what time. So Generating, for example, a test question is one part of it. Generating one right answer is another part of it. And then there's subsequent parts which are generate me the wrong answer and then make sure that the wrong answer is a valid wrong answer as well. So that's how that comes together. So they build on top of each other and it's very modular the way we set it up. So we just do more steps as part of a chain, essentially. Awesome. And I know we'll jump to the technology more later, but the, the model itself for the question is similar. Of course, the answers look very different because the use case is so so different. One other observation, I mean, you said, you know, um, I hope I got it right, but hard to do and easy to verify. You know, products like yours, I just realized, there's a luxury that you have an end user and 
an admin or a sales enablement pr- professional, because I'm assuming that second persona is the verifier in these instances, right? Um, and there's probably some workflow that's enhanced as a result of this, right? So now you've got your your free human in the loop, if you will, right? Who's highly vested and high expert for that company uh, to to do a lot of this, right? Yeah, and, and just to build up and build on that, um, Showpad is essentially a product where information is being curated and before it gets sent out to a marketeer. So from that perspective, there's there's a known concept of being human in the loop. Yeah, and that's just the natural workflow that AI can enhance, if, if you will. Correct. But very true. I think it's a good call out. Goref is like, um, yeah, we're actually using, as in it's a big advantage that we have sales enablement teams, marketing teams, uh, because they are indeed sort of, uh, yeah, free reinforcing, reinforcement learning through human feedback, um, and and they're they're true experts, right? As in, that's also they know their own domain. They know what the right uh, the right and the wrong answer is, uh, and for them, indeed, it's very easy to verify. But it's actually the same, by the way, for you talked about AI powered uh, asset summaries as well. So those FAQ as well. We also make it so that a rep can very easily sort of verify whether that answer is is correct. As in the UX kind of helps in in that. You see the document side by side and so on. They can click through on it. Uh, um, so there too, it's like a sales rep. Off, I mean, obviously, is trained in their field, whatever they're selling. So it can also quite easily verify is this actually correct or not. Great. Um, I think, Bram, you're going to talk about a couple more capabilities, and then we'll actually jump into some of the, the UX and uh, you know, implementation details. Yeah, so the, the, the two other ones that I actually wanted to, to talk about, so the, the ones that Jeroen was talking about, they're almost like, if you want to abstract it away, they're based on a single document. So you look at a, a single document and then use some kind of like generation to, to get either a summary or a test or a question out of it. Um, the second or the third capability is actually AI-powered search, which is literally a sort of application of um, retrieval augmented generation. So there we don't use a single document, but we actually use our search index to go look across all of the different documents. And that's it's sort of in, in three different steps. So the idea is, is just that a sales rep can go to our regular search, type it in, similar to what you've seen in Bing or uh, Google do as well. So you can type in a question and actually it generates an answer out of uh, the documents. But very important, very important in sales context actually is the fact that you can loop back to the source material and it, and again sort of verify that the the information that you're getting is actually is actually correct. Um, so for that we use that sort of three step uh, process. So first interpreting the question, then using that interpretation to actually send it to our sort of keyword or semantic search. So you get like a short list of, of documents to actually generate the, the the answer from. And then in the third step, you you extract or generate a sort of answer from that. Um, yeah. And just to make sure I understand, the search goes from returning a list of documents to kind of actually answering the query with referencing those documents that it answered the query from. Correct. So right now we're sort of taking a, a hybrid approach. For me, it's also still very much a question of how that UX will blend over time. So I think how search engines kind of what they look like fundamentally, we've been so used to sort of ordering like an, a list of results, a list of websites that you can click through or documents in, in this case. Um, you can already feel that it's kind of jarring in Google and Bing to have like both the the answer and the Gen AI and then still the list. So I think patterns will change over time, but f- for now we follow that same approach of actually mixing it in. So it's it pops up on top uh, the answer. It clearly shows that it's AI generated as well, uh, but you still get the full rest list of, of results. Potentially that's something that will change over time. And it's been an interesting use case for us, right? Because we know our customers use our search in a certain way and they expect a certain level of, they expect it to be very deterministic. They they say, okay, if I, if I 
input this word, if I if I make this query, I know these results are going to pop up. And now all of a sudden we're adding a not so deterministic element to it, which yeah. are okay. Now you can now ask questions, and depending on you know, like depending on the state of the system, also the the the, the randomness, the temperature of the AI and that we set in the background, like you you might get a, a an answer to a question that you never saw before. That's still based on on relevant sources, right? But it might be formatted in a different way. It might have two sentences more, two sentences less. So as part of, of that AI-powered search feature that we launched, we also had to indicate very clearly in different points that parts were AI-generated. We also have been suggesting questions to ask as well so that people know that they can now ask a question versus typing in keywords, for example, which is what you and I are used to when, for example, using Google, right? We know how to use Google and we don't ask the full question. We almost intelligently know which keywords to ask to trigger Google to give us the right responses. Let's just actually move to the user interface because we spent so much time talking about it, right? Uh, so you already mentioned making it very clear when AI generates a piece of information. Um, uh, you also talked a little bit about the end user feedback, right? Um, um, are those the key user interface principles? Are there other things that you look at, uh, especially when it comes to rolling out AI-powered uh, capabilities? Yeah. So uh, again, I want to take a step back here, right? Because just we have to keep in mind here, our product really focuses on surfacing existing content. It, f- it focuses on surfacing a marketing brochure or a marketing video that's been highly curated, that's in a very good state, and that's been uploaded by some kind of administrator who then distributes that to the salespeople around the world that use it in front of their customers. And so with AI, I think Brom mentioned this before, for the first time, we're generating content that's not been curated, that's not been generated by a marketing team or that's not been uploaded by an administrator. It's essentially brand new the moment that it it comes out in the UI. And so at least one of the things we are doing here is we to avoid confusion we we make sure that we very clearly indicate in the UI what is curated and what is generated. And you know the saying, right? Like simple mechanisms scale, and that's exactly what we've done in our product. So on one hand, we've said, okay, let's use a very clear and recognizable iconography. So let's use existing icons that you see everywhere, like the looking glass for search. But let's augment it with something consistent like a sparkle that shows, okay, this is AI powered. And that sparkle is something that you find back in, in, in ChatGPT, for example. You also use the notion of a sparkle to indicate AI. And then the second thing we use is we use a very vibrant color, consistent vibrant color, like it's a purple color in Showpad, but we just highlight that it's a very unique color as well. So every time you see something purple in our platform, you know, okay, this is probably AI generated. And if you combine that with a sparkle, you know, okay, I'm definitely here at something that is generated and I, I need to... You know, like I know it's not curated. I know it's not coming from my marketing agent. It is actually something that the AI created. And a question on that: um, Is today AI generated content purely meant for internal consumption, or are we already at a point where the AI generated content is shareable with the with the customer's customer, right, externally, or is there like a kind of thick line between those two, right, at the moment? Hmm. It's well. It's a it's a good question. I I mean, it's probably also something that marketing will tell you, which is that they have zero control over what sales does, and that's probably <laughs> the the whole problem. So um, we're presenting it to sales reps, so they'll do something with it. So that line is is thin, right? The trust is yeah. Um, interestingly, like talking about trust was also something that customers gave us feedback. Um, cause we asked them like, do you trust the outputs of, of, for example, jet chat GPT and so on. And, uh, they literally likened it to, well, we don't really have control over what sellers are saying and that's problematic enough. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily worse. They were saying than uh, than, than the trust level we have in sellers, um, but so for now, it's sort of internal, and we are keeping the rep sort of as a as we're we're definitely putting the trust with the rep. We're not automatically yeah. sending that kind of content out. But but in one way, you're almost putting guardrails because you're seeding rep with information which may be AI generated, but at least it's generated from marketing approved 
uh, content, right? So they might be yeah. setting the reps in the right direction, which is both helpful for the reps, but also could help with consistency, which, as, as you mentioned, can sometimes be a challenge. But exactly, right? So in terms of the answers, they were actually quite interesting. Like if they start trusting that and they... They also had proof points that reps and marketing, they were, I mean, in a lot of the companies that we talked to, they're already using chat GPT or something like that on the side. Um, so they'd rather have a bit more control over it than, than um, and, and provide it in the product than uh, just that kind of wild, uh, wild use. I also think, as in, um, maybe think that there's definitely also differences between different companies and different industries in terms of what kind of answers are allowed. So we we work with highly regulated industries as well. There, of course, sort of the way that the model answers, it probably needs to be a lot more cautious about certain things. Um, so it's not something we've built in right now, but we've definitely considered that when, when I was talking to Irun and the team on, on that is that we might actually use sort of different models depending on whether you're in a sort of more commercial tech industry where you might actually want to use internet-based information. So an LLM that kind of freely answers based on uh, based on freely available information might actually be really, really useful. Um, whereas there might be other industries that really want to keep it very close to just extracting information from from their own knowledge base. So that temperature it, it could actually shift depending on the um, depending on the industry or use case. Indeed, and that that's also kind of where our our use case is so interesting, right? Is like because we are dealing with we're trying to add a layer of um, magic on top of something that's traditionally sometimes very curated. And you hear it today as well, right? Like LMs can hallucinate, for example. They can invent things. They can invent facts that don't exist, right? Um, and especially in how we apply AI, that's a very important component, right? Like how can we how can we give that trust? How can we make sure customers trust us to correctly apply this technology? And because you know, like with an with a with an LLM, right? You're talking probabilities. So there's never any certainty you can give. So there's also, like for us, this notion of responsible AI becomes important, meaning that thinking about like, how do we keep the human in the loop? How do we provide auditing mechanisms to make sure that when something is generated, it always pops up and you can always verify it and see, okay, what was generated? Why was it generated? How did it happen? What was the impact? What was the reach of that thing that was generated? So those things become, I think, we don't see that a lot in a lot of consumer facing applications, but in a lot of B2B applications, that's the industry that we're in, and especially on of enterprise applications, we that's something we feel like is super important, something we really want to focus on because it's all about trust. And I that's yeah. super it's, it's super relevant for a company like Showpad to invest in making AI trustworthy. Well, you know, I was going to ask a question on how do you deal with accuracy, but I think you've already answered it. So let me recap and see if, if, if this, and it's very interesting. One, it's really important, right? Uh, in your industry, in the enterprise use case, you don't want to be sharing information, which is either not relevant or in the compliance use cases, relevant, but not advisable to share or not allowed. Um, and you've got some le levers. You've got a natural human little loop by having multiple personas that can kind of kind of check some of the answers. But they can't check it all the time because if you do the search in the AI-powered search, it just comes there. But there you can kind of reference the source, which helps. And second, I think you mentioned that, you know, maybe not today, but you're looking at potentially, um, you know, controlling the amount of flexibility the AI has based on the customer industry vertical, based on which sources they look at, what use cases and how much you use. So, you know, Snap uses ChatGPT, but what they call a safe version of ChatGPT. And you're kind of toggling that in a variety of different ways, uh, which is which is very interesting. I think this is a good time to kind of talk a little bit more about the tech stack. Uh, so, Jaron, could you just at a high level, start by describing the overall architecture? Um, and, and, and it may change by use case, but maybe at least, you know, the whole, hopefully the overall architecture has some common components. At, at the current rate, it might have changed by the time this podcast goes live. <laughs> so, um, the, the the interesting thing is, like, so maybe I'll, I'll walk through a couple of key components. But what's what's super interesting to to keep in mind is, um, 
and what we see as well, the industry as a whole is exploring and is trying to find best practices and standards on how to apply these components in the right way. And so the way I like to call that is we're, as a whole, as an industry, we're looking for what's the right engineering rigor. What's the right way of bringing, bringing the discipline, the, the systematic approach, so to speak, to, to this field of basically applying LLMs and AI into consumer products, into B2B products. So how do you deal with testing? How do you deal with deployment? All these kinds of things. I think the industry at large is starting to mature into right now. It's, I don't think it's there yet. It will require some time. But this is what makes it interesting for us as well, because that's what we are looking for. So when we're looking at, at like our architecture, obviously there's, there's an LLM in there. There's, a, there's actually multiple LLMs because depending on the use case, we'll, we'll pick the LLM that is the most cost effective, right? Performance versus cost is super important for us. There's obviously an orchestration layer that takes input, that starts to chain prompts, that starts to make sure that we can go from here is something I want to have an input and here is then the output, right? And then we go on, we have a experimentation landscape as well. So the data scientists and the analysts can very, very quickly and very easily kind of play around with different prompts. They can play around with how to optimally design these. Obviously, and then to put everything together, we have some kind of an ML ops, LLM ops. It changes the name because you know, like the industry is moving very quickly, but we have like a bit of a fabric underneath that makes sure that we can bring these things to production with the right engineering rigor, with the right best practices and standards, right? And that's what we kind of put under LM ops. It's the CICD, it's the testing, it's the evaluation frameworks to make sure that we can keep consistency towards our customers and towards the product that we ship. And just double clicking on the part around the either the orchestration or more broadly customizing the large language models. You know, mm -hmm. how do you do that? Are you actually doing you know, fine tuning, or is it about vector embeddings? Is it about something else? How are you personalizing the language models to suit your overall use case? So it, it first of all, starts with what, what's the right language model to use, right? And so mm -hmm. there, that's, that's what it starts with. We have, I'm not going to go into too much detail, uh, obviously, for obviously Secret reasons. sauce. Um, some of it is. Um, but here's what I'm going to tell you, like some things like asset summaries are relatively easy and cheap to do with very low parameter LLMs. So like smaller model size LLMs, right? They can take a piece of text and summarize it to few, a few sentences. So that's what we use for things like asset summaries and for, for test generation. But for something that's more conversational in nature, which is our AI powered search, we go to some more powerful higher parameter mm -hmm. LMs that are able to understand more of the context. They're able to much more specifically take input from multiple documents and they're able to surface that in a package that combine that into a cohesive set of sentences, not just one sentence, not just one answer, but a cohesive paragraph, for example, which is what we're giving to customers right now. You talked a bit about, um, you talked a bit about like, vector databases, embeddings, all these kinds of things. We're using that as well, because in order to understand what documents to use, for example, to answer questions, we need to know what the semantic meaning is of what's in those documents, right? And that's yeah. what we use embeddings for, right? Like, so we basically take, we try to compare which documents are semantically linked to the question that you're as asking. We use that, those documents or the, the, the content of those documents, and then we feed that into our LLM and to in our orchestration mechanism to then get you a um, response. And I can only imagine, given uh, the referenceability, knowing this paragraph that's auto-generated, what document it comes from, the vector database helps with the other side of it as well, not just to customize, but to uh, uh, provide the ability to kind of reference back to the source material as well, versus entirely relying on the LLM. Indeed. It's, it's, uh, and the thing is as well, even these embeddings are just useful for just regular semantic search, right? So without the LLM, without the, the AI mechanism to generate new output, just using those to semantically cluster documents that are similar is actually very useful for just search alone, for example. You didn't go into, you know, specific which LLMs you use, no problem. But to the extent that you use public API LLMs versus open source that is fully under yes. your control, 
How do you think about managing the kind of privacy of customer data if you're using kind of third-party services where uh, you're sharing that information? For us, the trust and relationship that we get from our customers to deal, to play around with our data, or play around to actually use our data to better use, is it's like the most important thing for us, right? So we are extremely careful about what LMs do we use, where are they hosted, where is the data going that we are adding to the prompt and putting in the context window. So we're extremely, I would say, like not obsessed, but we are, you know, like we find it one of the most important things because we want to give the same guarantees to our customers that we've been giving them so far about how, what we're doing with our data and how we're using it. So we're staying away from from API, high level API based, open AI type things who cannot give us those guarantees, and we're sticking to solutions that can give us those guarantees and to good effect, right? Like we're still able to to make these things happen. Well, I think Sam Altman might have heard you or might have predicted what you're going to say. I think they launched yeah. ChatGPT Enterprise yesterday that may uh, uh, make it more feasible. Um, Bram, uh, yeah. let's switch gears a little bit. Um, so there's so much stuff happening uh, when it comes to AI. Um, but as a, any good product lead, it's not just about you know launching the capabilities, it's about measuring the success of those capabilities. Um, how do you measure success of your AI offerings or the AI capabilities? Some of it is still in, in sort of closed beta with a, with a couple of customers. So I think the, the first sense you want to get is sort of applause, excitement, right? So that's as in, that is a big part, like how is it being received by our, by our customer base? You've been in similar roles as well. It's also about exciting prospects and, and so on. So that's, I think... That already is a big part of sort of measuring mm-hmm. measuring success, and I can honestly say we've been really really successful in in that part with uh, really a lot of excitement across our customer base, and uh, I think also within our industry quite a quite a clear messaging, which I really love. Um, I think longer term, I mean, we've talked about the 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 different features, so I'll maybe go into to a couple of those. I think it's very much right now about about adoption. So let's take uh, the AI part search as an example there. It's really what kind of action do you take? Do we get signals that that was actually useful? What context was that useful in? What feedback are we are we getting uh, from that? Can we tie it back to to impact on a deal like a better buyer interaction? That's ultimately what what you're after or more efficiency uh, or a more effective seller. So those are the things that we'll be we'll be measuring and are actually fairly similar to how you measure impact of content and and so on. So on that sense it's it's fairly uh, fairly similar when you're looking at like AI powered test generation for example there it's really about efficiency gains of uh, of marketing. And I think also to a, some extent, because sometimes that's um, kind of in a very data-informed way overlooked a bit in, in product management is how much happiness and excitement this is actually generating with with learning managers. Yeah. And some of them that I talked about, uh, or some of them that I talked with, they were literally like, wow, I mean, this yeah. is this is amazing yeah. if, I, if I would have this, this is like, Literally, I would. Um, I think one said like that would shave off like a full day of of launching a campaign. So, um, just measuring that excitement, happiness, uh, um, or effort score is typically what we measure. There is also really important. Yeah, and I suppose it's fairly easy to track our is content being auto generated in the platform, or is it being typed? And if it's being typed, it's taking a lot of time to actually type that first in Google Docs and then paste it in there. Um, and and I think the other thing that you mentioned, you know, in in, in especially because you sell to enterprises, qualitative mm. feedback is is that early indicator, but also extremely important early indicator, right? Um, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I thought I thought Jaron was going to say the way we measure success is making sure not everyone passes the interview questions hundred percent, because otherwise those fake answers are really bad fake answers. But uh, but I guess that could be another signal. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's 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 one of the things we are measuring, right? It's like how many, like in that specific use case, how many changes are being made to the questions we're generating, for example. Mm. Um, it, 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 what, what's really important, and I think that's that's one of the bigger realizations, is like um, 
the use case and knowing and understanding the use case is ex- stays extremely important. Right? The the product management basics stay extremely important even with this new technology and measuring success isn't just about okay we've got a new super tool let's just apply the new super tool no it's it's really still about like look at asset summaries right i mentioned it before we didn't just make a summary we made an faq because that was the most most appropriate thing to do and aligning with the use case and understanding what what's the job to be done here what's the job that that your 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 users trying to accomplish still remains super important and measuring towards that remains super important yeah, something I was uh, ironically something I was thinking of as you were seeing that Irun was um, a bit of an uh, an anecdote almost is that we had that that use case of like um, uh, generating test questions and and answers and I mean we know that's pretty hard to do for for humans but it also turned out to be really hard to actually coerce a, a large language model in answering wrong because obviously they've been trained to 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 kind of answer the right thing so that was actually trickier than than uh, than what we expected we were forcing them to hallucinate basically yeah it's like hallucination as a as a feature so that's yeah. pretty tricky yeah awesome well uh, let's just switch gears a little bit um and talk about the org structure right um yeah. mm-hmm. Uh, how is your org structured as it relates to the artificial intelligence talent uh, in the company? Again, taking a step back here, it's a very interesting question because AI in general, like, is part of a it's part of a larger data story at Showpad, and isn't just about AI. It's about innovation using data powered by data, not just AI. Again, here is a tool that we're using. So, also the organization is set up as what we what we have today is not just it's not just about AI talent, it's also your product talent, it's your engineering talent, it's your design talent, right? We talked about UX before. It's also about cultivating, for example, design to start thinking about, okay, how can we indicate that something is generated by an AI versus curated from by marketing? So with respect specifically to data, like uh, one of the things we did with Showpad is two years ago, we said, okay, like we really need to start focusing on data. And so we we basically said, okay, let's start increasing our data maturity in Showpad. And we created an organization two years ago that's focused specifically on the big pillars in any data organization being data engineering, analytics, and data science. With the goal of on basically creating a set of teams that focus on enabling other teams because any data product isn't built by a single team. It's, it's literally, the, the, like I just said, right? It's the combination of your entire engineering and product and design organizations. Everyone together who's building a product that needs to be involved. But with a technology like AI, you need certain teams that are at the spearhead, that are pushing the innovation, that are developing those levels of maturity, that are developing expertise so that you can set out best practices, you can set out standards to uh, the rest of the organization so you can accelerate those. And that's exactly what we're doing, right? Like we're trying to enable as many people in the organization as we can on AI. So everyone starts to think independently of how they can apply AI to their use case, but we're supporting everyone with best practices and trying to just lower that adoption curve, lower that um, learning curve in the organization. Actually, that's a really good point that it doesn't start with AI. Uh, it starts with data and the right yeah. clean data pipeline. So you've almost built a centralized data team, but a distributed kind of AI capabilities on top, right? Um, and and I think that's a yeah. really interesting way to to, to structure AI the team. And for us has been a bit of a cherry on the cake on all that work, right? Like building a data lake, building a data pipeline, making sure that there's an environment for data scientists to do their work on AI yeah. so that they have notebooks that they can work in that allows them, that they can connect to existing data so that they can easily train and test models and, and make sure they're effective. So we've been able to ship a lot of these things, I think, in, in, re- in record time, in months, not years, because we had a lot of that foundation, that data foundation ready to go. So the data foundation, the ML Ops foundation, as you talked about earlier, and those yeah. things are centralized to make every engineer, PM, and UX uh, uh, designer more effective. Mm, uh, correct. Look, this has been a fantastic conversation. We talked, we covered a wide range of array of topics from the vision of sales enablement as it relates, especially to to, to generated AI, to all the cool capabilities, but also some of the best practices around ops, around UX, around 
the deciding the right LLMs. Um, so thank you, Yaron. Thank you, Bram, for this amazing conversation. Um, and I can't wait to see what you keep on rolling out in the next weeks and months to come. Anytime. Our pleasure. It's been a blast. Yeah. Fun. <laughs>